Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We, we are here to, as part of our celebration of the Global Entrepreneurship Week, we have a series of activities, and this is one of the key events that we have here at Clark Valley University this week. Uh, I am so delighted to have in my company, John O'Brien. John is very well known. John is the founder, the chairman, the CEO of Operation Hub. Has done so much in this community and around the world in the space of entrepreneurship. So there's no one better than John to sit here by me to talk about entrepreneurship in this global entrepreneurship week. John also is our inaugural entrepreneur in residence here at Clark Valley University here in the business school. So welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. I'm a fan of yours, man. Thank you. I think you're an amazing human being. I appreciate it. Yeah. Our I, folks. I understated, yeah. underrated, underappreciated problem. Uh, <laughs> you your, your, your class act. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I said you were your head of the MBA program. A moment ago, she called some very impressive. Yes. Yeah. You, have a, you have a great team. That's your Mr. George. I'm sure she is. We have these uh, <laughs> running on. It, uh, we have uh, folks on Zoom, and we have, uh, is LinkedIn Live on? It is not. So we are showing the LinkedIn Live. Okay. We Good enough. We are live on the school's Instagram page. Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you. So uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week is really intended to bring together uh, you know, an awareness about entrepreneurship around the world. Uh, in the U.S., we celebrate this, typically this second week of November, and there are a number of activities, again, to highlight this. When we look at entrepreneurship, it was about 1700 B.C. Mm. It's the first recorded And you step back in that history to about 500 BC, Mesopotamia. We began settlement of groups that became town, that became city. And then we move from the, as you, you, see, you tell the history back, from the agricultural economy, from just gatherers, to have groups in these villages, towns, and cities that are gatherers that began battle, trade by battle, yeah. of entrepreneurship. And here we are, 2023, and we look uh, around the room and there's this notion that entrepreneurship is the foundation for, for wealth, for building generational wealth. John, what are your thoughts about all of this history and getting to where you are today as a premier entrepreneur in Atlanta, Georgia? First of all, I think your brain is very sick. <laughs> um, I think for those of you who are listening to you, no one's ever in an interview gone back to 1790 and, and taken the time, the thought, the thoughtfulness to be. Connect the dots. I mean, that just alone shows, underscores what a wonderful human being you are. You're very thoughtful. You know, it takes Quincy Jones, one of my mentors, um, he would say it takes 20 years to change a culture. And in the last 20 years, I think we made dumb sexy. We dumbed down and celebrated. Um, and we have to make smart sexy again. And the next move is from the shoulders, is from the neck up. The last one was from the shoulders down. We use this, we use these, you know, we use physical. And we, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta be, you know, masters of our mindset. <clears throat> so that's what, it's, first of all, I say, I think you just represent uh, where we're going. And you're one of the reasons, like the principal course, but, uh, of course, you're one of the reasons I said yes to 
to do it. And, and I'm almost more excited about being the Archbishop John of Residence than I am being the Board of Trustees because this is very actionable for me. I mean, this is hopefully the first of many engagements. And uh, I had a video last week that had like two and a half million people viewed just on Instagram alone. And I want to be able to do content from here that drives attention and intentions and uh, conversations. So I'm going to be more intentional about that going forward. So the answer. Uh, by the way, it's no accident that the room, I know you, you know, you, you do, you know, we have a lot of space, you invite a lot of people, but it, it, it's all, it's all, you know, mostly black women, you know, brother here. But if you look at what happened after the pandemic, uh, the number one group starting businesses after the pandemic were black people. Not a minority group, but everybody in America. And the number one group of all groups starting businesses. Black women. So it makes sense that, you know, it's majority black women we need more brothers like this to step up and become the role models we want to see in the world, too. Um, people know me from Operation Hope, uh, and they should, uh, but I have five portfolios in the job of Brian Uh Financial literacy for all, so three of which are the largest in the, in the category in the, in the country. We're the largest economy in the world. America is the largest economy in the world, as you know. With 21, 22 trillion of 100 trillion dollar global economy. There's up to 8 billion people in the world, so there's 3 to 2 million people in America. So statistically, it's an anomaly to have the largest economy in the world really with a microcosm of population of people. I mean, China's trying to overtake us. They, they have, you know, approaching 2 billion people. It's trying to overtake us. We only have 350 million people. But when you have this kind of brain power and energy, it, 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 it's, it's the, the ripple effect of this kind of energy is you know 100x when you put it into the economy. So I have five portfolios, financial, financial literacy for all, affordable housing for all, access to opportunity and access to capital for all, an empowering message for all. Uh, and and then legacy. And so uh, we're the largest uh, voice in financial literacy uh, in the country. We're about 200 million people who are growing deals with iHeart and Zoom and DC and others to really make it so that everywhere you go, you see this message and actually happen in the next couple of years. We're the largest financial literacy organization in America, that's Operation Hope, and including the One Million Black Business Initiative. We locked up and went towards the work. Um, we created 380,000. We created and urged people to support it. 380,000 black businesses since October 2020. Just put that in context. There's only 3.1 million black businesses in America. So we're more than 10%. We're not the government. We're just, we're just an organization. But we've nurtured more than 10% of all black businesses in America in just over two years. So we're ahead of schedule on the million black business agenda. Each one of those businesses gets up to $25,000 in support uh, through website, domain name, payment system, Shopify account, delivery system, e commerce support, business plan, credit scoring, counseling, and coaching. You're getting credit scores up 50 to 120 points in 24 months. Nothing changes your life more than God and love and more than Christ score 120 points. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we, we give you accountant, lawyer, marketing assistance, support, all these professionals on the back end to help you wrap around your businesses. So that's just for one of the initiatives. We, we have 274 offices, physical offices that are staffed in 40 states. And we're like the Starbucks of financial inclusion. Uh, and we have 850 satellite offices at True Bank alone. So if you add those two uh, pieces along, we have over a thousand, well over a thousand locations across the country. Nobody is even remotely close. Um, and my goal is to be 10% of the entire banking system. The only nonprofit not out is like a bank breaking group. The only nonprofit is in the country. I mean, they should close to 90,000 black employees every year. You want to double flight half of the people in the flight, flight attendants are nonprofits. Um, and we're giving them $1,000. Thank you, C. No Delta, a thousand dollar emergency savings account if they go to the Thank You Coaching Program. It goes on, it goes on, it goes on. But that's Operation Hope. 
and with the largest minority owner of single family rental homes in America. That's the promise home company. So uh, we bought 700 homes uh, between June of 2017 that I sold the company in Christmas Eve 2021 for $121 million. Uh, and I became a partner in the, the new ownership. And uh, I own 100% of the company now, 38%. Sheets. 
Different person made the key, made the company. Different person made the tunnel. Different person. Uh, I'm trying to think about what else. Let me see. Uh, tell me I did the magic. Okay. Carpet or the floor. That's some entrepreneur. Tell me how. Base skirt. Bed skirt. Yeah. Um, the housing itself. Who owns the apartment building or the home? That may be me, by the way. But literally, like <laughs> literally everything in your life. Uh, 24 hours a day. 24 hours. 24 hours a day. 24 hours. And then some people say, oh, I hate rich people. <laughs> no, you don't. You hate rich people until you become rich. But you hated the game system. Right. Or the, oh, I hate capitalism. No, you don't. You live your whole life with capitalism. That's right. Whether you re not recognize it or not. In fact, you're a human capital. Yeah. You're actually trying to get your, your education so that you can take your skill, trade your skill for the lowest, maybe the lowest risk formula for business is to take your skill and get a paycheck and change your skill in somebody's company. 80% of all jobs in America are, are private business. So, I was with the master of Saudi Arabia three days ago in DC. Probably they had in the Middle East and they used to send their jobs to government. Uh, uh, all throughout the Middle East, they used to send the jobs to government. Here, you need to send the jobs to private. So, so you're trying to trade your human capital, human capital, for a paycheck. So you limit your risk because you get to go home at five, you come in at nine, you get home at five or six. You're a corporate executive or whatever. That's cool. Somebody else is taking an option. So you have. Jobs, you have employment, you have careers, as well as the I call it for careers, and then you got the level does level risk because you have a small business. And people don't realize the small business is different than entrepreneurship. Okay. People confuse that it's completely different. And so the, the highest level of in your corporate executives, the highest level of risk is entrepreneurship, which is crazy. Like me, I'm just, I'm just I'm putting it up. <laughs> Because you can lose everything right. on some new idea. Yes, you guys want to guess what the difference is between business and entrepreneurship? No wrong answers. The level of risk. The level of risk, but but, but literally, yes, literally, what's the difference? So, so I'll give you a hint. Uh, I'm going to help you a little bit. So, a franchise, think Chick Fil A, think McDonald's, think uh, tell me other. Starbucks. Starbucks. Some of them are franchises, and those are the company that's put it down. But same concept. So that's an existing business plan. It's been proven. It's rinse and repeat. You go into a market, you do X, Y, and Z. You, you, you do it right, and you know you're not guaranteed a profit, but you know likely likelihood that you work hard. The business is going to be successful because it's a business plan. That's a business plan. So then, how does that differ from being an entrepreneur? Boom. There you go. Create something new. So everything that I've done is entrepreneurship. There was no business plan for any of the stuff that I've done, which is what makes it real off. It makes it real off. So, <laughs> so an entrepreneur, I for an employee, my payroll is a million dollars every two weeks. Payroll. And I've been doing this for 31 years. Uh, and I'm the, one of the largest, this is, makes me sad, I'm one of the largest uh, black uh, black employees in the country. This is really sad because you believe people employ four thousand people, not four hundred. Right. So, uh, entrepreneurship is like the boat that that sailed without us. In fact, it sailed because of us. It's a whole other story. Right. But it sailed without us, and that's why I think what you're doing here is so radically important because literally the only group we have left behind out of the two hundred different groups in America, the three that got left behind. We never talked free enterprise, capitalism, economics, ownership, and entrepreneurship. Didn't have access to capital or, or opportunity. Didn't understand the free enterprise system. African American, Native American Indian, or white. Like 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 everybody else. Tell Even blacks from other regions, black Caribbean, black African. Nigerians come here, the Ethiopians come here. Within two years, they got to, you know, just go from being a doorman at the hotel to uh, owning three 
SUVs, we've been providing the car service to people who are coming out the hotel. And, you know, you go to go to go to Park Hyatt in Washington DC. I was there two days ago. All of Ethiopians at the front door, yes. they locked up every business from the front, from the cap, from the from the from the, uh, the check-in to the to the curb. They yeah. own all that. That's right. They own all that, and they have all those relationship capital, and they own the, the, the Uber. They got a whole network of people with, with SUVs and town cars and whatever. They have a valet service. They got transport services. They, all, they, they came here for nothing, but three or four years later, they built it. So, it's, so, so the inspiring part is it's not just about race, quality of race, but it, 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 it is not true that if you're black, you'll never be successful. It's not true. It's not also not true that if you're white, you're automatically successful. If that was true, you wouldn't have four white. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting that uh, you bring up this notion of just getting up in the morning and getting to work. As, as a thought, you know, it, it is the continual activities. Because I actually use this in my classes. When you look at production, logistics, mm -hmm. material movement, I always tell my students to begin the day from just waking up. And, and chronically, everything you do from when you wake up till you get to class, for instance or you get to work. There's so much there that involves everything that we teach. Okay? Everything we teach. Production, material movement, uh, organization, management, marketing, all of this is embodied in that, and that's what you just explained in, 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 in entrepreneurship. I just counted 10 entrepreneurs I'm wearing. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> the, the manufacturer and designer of the shoes, the manufacturer and designer of the socks, the manufacturer and designer of the, the suit, the black entrepreneur who made my shirt, the entrepreneur who made my, my watch. I mean, the, the, somebody made this, it's different than made this. Uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, we, we just take all this stuff for granted. We do. We do. From that, from that angle, you have all this events, activities that you're involved in, that your various businesses. And here at the university we have, we teach entrepreneurship. There are a number of people that says, well, you can't teach entrepreneurship. Not true. Uh, people could just step out of it. But we teach entrepreneurship. You can't, you can't teach, teach risk. You can't teach uh, hard and risk, but you teach entrepreneurship. Yes. So for, we, we have, Concentrations at the undergraduate and graduate level. Mm -hmm. We have a center for innovation and technology development. Mm -hmm. We now have a center uh, that, that uh, Jamie here uh, is one of the leaders of the center that, uh, in partnership with Howard University, the PNC oh, yeah. uh, Center mm -hmm. for the, we are the Southeast Center for mm -hmm. Regional Center for Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. so we have these activities. There is really a micro ecosystem for entrepreneurship in Brazil. How can all of these activities come together to work to help, if there's any way to help, what you do mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur in all of these areas mm -hmm. that we are here uh, working with these students to at least get them the mindset mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs. How can organizations like yours leverage what we have as students and vice versa. Well, so I thought we were going to have a nice little leisurely, low key. Now you're talking about the social movement, which gets me real excited. Look, I, I try, I really try not to have every conversation be this like deep situation, but look, we're sitting in a moment in history right now. But history never feels as good as we're sitting in it. This was not another day. Um, this is the third reconstruction. They started with George Floyd's murder. It was early 2030, my estimation. Some people are trying to shorten it. Some political people are trying to shorten it. And some black people are helping them shorten it, by the way. And so that's in the way you like. But we shoot ourselves in the foot, I'm sure I do some a little bit. But third reconstruction was, uh, was after the Civil War. That was freedom. That was Lincoln and Herbert Dunn. 
to make that. So the previous time period is going to be my probably two, three slides about money. Um, I'm the only other citizen of the union to call the White House meeting and deliver the White House campus. We can call the chairman of the campus building now, call the previous time board. That was just three years ago. So that's where most of us put our money. Uh, that's for the war, and then the bank failed, which is why we have such bankers. So. Mm -hmm. So always, there's always background noise in our in our spirits that they're not aware of. During the Second Reconstruction and Civil War, that was about, uh, I'm sorry, that Second Reconstruction and Civil Rights Movement, that was about uh, access. Access to jobs, access to clothing, access to universities, um, access to careers, about cash and checks. Finally, of course, it wasn't for free in the United in the slave trade. And the Third Reconstruction is about flying the chair. That's now. There's no new about the new flag. And the new color is red. Not black or white or red or blue, it's just red. You cannot have a movement without young people. You need the idealism, you need, you, you need the passion, you need, you need the aspiration to do anything. And so, first, the first ingredient necessary for that, you, you're, you're there because all these movements are grounded in universities or other places of higher education. Power. So you have youth and, and high energy and high frequency. So, so you have that here. Um, I've already said this movement is going to be from the shoulders up. Uh, so now you're in a place of higher education. <coughs> so you got that. Um, you have, you know, these movements tend to hide in plain sight. Uh, well, you know, uh, here we go again. Um, Malcolm X said, we didn't have who, who. <laughs> we didn't trick. We've been fooled. My mentor, Bachelor Andrew Young, would say we live in a system of free enterprise. Not to understand the rules of free enterprise must be the very definition of slavery. So you leave this campus <coughs> and you go two blocks, three blocks in any direction, and you see a check casher. That's what pays all the money. Next to a rental home store. Liquor store, next to a liquor store, next to a title lending store, next to a pawn shop. <laughs> in some cases, in some places, a renting rim store is not as much as it used to be. It used to be rented. There's actually rent, rent, you know, rims in your car. Mm -hmm. And then you charge your insurance and hope you get it. Right. And then there's a church down the street. That's your neighborhood. Black colleges. You may be a therapist. You don't want to admit you're crazy. And a funeral home. Which is a bulletproof business. No pun intended. Yes. Ne ne we're never part of business. That's right. I mean, I just had one of my cousins killed yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. Yesterday. 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 Wow. I get a call from my auntie. She was murdered in a hotel in St. Louis. So I figured this is me. I'm so sorry. And she was, of course, devastated, but she also wasn't surprised because of the, the life you lived and so on and so forth. So I'm just trying to make sure she's she's good. But trauma is like an everyday occurrence. And how could you be in my family? How could you have access to me and what we've done? And that's the reality. Now, I can't babysit you. I can't go and I can't go and shove this down your throat. So, but but I'm right here. But that but he's but, but he's gone. A member of the triplet family. It's gone. The story is over. Hiding in plain sight. So these communities I just mentioned to you are five eighty fair square neighborhoods. My cousin was murdered. We grew up in in the context of the culture of a five hundred fair square neighborhood. And you have this church down the street that's like a therapist. Can we go in there? We used to go there. Part of the problem is we're not going anymore. Right. We used to go there, we scream, we holler, hallelujah, get out of our system. And that became the therapist. And we don't do that anymore. We don't talk to him anymore. Right. Everything's money. Money, 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 fame, whatever. We're living, we're wondering why we're crazy. A little conversation. All the riots, all the homicides, all the drugs, all the single parent households. All the problems, five or six related. All of them. You never had a riot. 
in a 700 credit score neighborhood in all of American history. At any rate, 700 credit score neighbors don't ride to go shopping. <laughs> Real talk. You don't get abused by the police in a 700 credit score neighborhood. I don't care what race you are. They don't pull you over and slam you on the ground because you call them there. Because you're a taxpayer, or whatever the answer is. They're not doing that. All the problems. Do you know you live? Let me give you a real, a real, give you a real social justice reason to, to do what you're suggesting, which is to latch on to this movement, or me to latch on to yours, and they spread it to every HBCU. We, we, Alfred Hope, we map every credit score, every zip code in America by credit score. We use very in data. You know you live 61 years old in a 500 credit score neighborhood? Wow. You live at 81 years old, 15, 15 minutes away in a 700 credit score neighborhood. I'm going to repeat that real slowly. <laughs> this is every zip, by the way, we map every zip code in America. It's completely identical. Whether it's white, poor, rural, and by the way, that's check cashing, payday lending, rent on store, title lending, example the kids. If you're in a poor, white, rural neighborhood, Thing. It's just that they don't hoop and holler in their churches. And they ride in, in the ballot box. But we ride in the streets, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's going on right now with the former president. It's a bunch of people angry, frustrated that the world walked away from them 60 years ago after the Industrial Revolution. Nobody retrained them. They want their pickup truck, they want their boat, and they want their middle class lifestyle, the highest education, and, they, and they're upset that somebody snatched it from them. And he wants somebody to blame. And this dude's running around marketing fear so, and marketing frustration and tongues go to the ballot box and why? And they're riding in the ballot box. We're going to get them nowhere because, because anger and frustration and resentment is not a business point. Right. But, but what we all just suggesting is this is a game that everybody's playing. So you're poor white rural, which is the largest population of poverty, by the way. Nobody even knows the largest population of poverty in this country of white people. Largest population of transfer payments recipients are white. And this is amazing. We can blame the brand and all this stuff. It's not us. And then uh, even the mortgage price in 2008 was more 53% of all defaults in lost wealth and mortgage prices in 2008 were white. Even though we were targeted because of the other issues, but, it, but statistically it was more white because it's more, more white people in the country. Now, and if around a military base, you get to the, you go, go to the entrance of a military base. What do you see at the entrance? Check cash and pay the money with all sorts of title and So it's the it's the game. And you live to 61 years old. You can't get social security, Dean, until you're 65. That's right. So you work your whole life and you're dead before you uh, you're approved. And you drive 15 minutes away from that address on average, and those people live to 71 to 95 years old. 15 minutes away. Nothing's changed. Except your environment, right? So, if you don't have agency in your life, is a long way of saying it. If you don't have agency in your life, if you don't, it is, it is entirely possible that the only true freedom is financial freedom. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. I really want people to like. Yes. I want people to challenge. And by the way, this didn't come from me. CEO of Key Bank, really good guy, white guy, great. CEO Key Bank told me one day we were opening a location. He said, you know, I've been able to see what you're saying. And he said, it's research. He says, every other freedom you take away from it. Take money. Religious freedom. Social, political. Every other freedom you take away. But once you understand money, once you have financial freedom, unless you screw it up, no one will take away from you. So the only true freedom you have control over. Think about my Jewish friends. So real talk. Yes. They have financial freedom. They do. They do. They're the smallest minority in the world. Well, how much power you got? 15 million Jews and almost 8 billion people. How's so amazing in the world? You don't mess with them. That's right. And in some ways, black need black, a black Jewish business plan. And yes, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been looking for love in all the wrong places. We're nice, we're loving, we're forgiving. My God, black is so forgiving. We're, we, we, we have all these wonderful traits, but we're broke. And, and statistics say we don't do what you just suggested. By 2052, net worth of black people will be. Mm -hmm. 
too much. This is not like a way to get around to it. Maybe you should like think about this. No, no, this is the end game. If we don't do this, we're done. So should we do this? No, you have to do this. This has to be. No group has of underserved people have catapulted to a place of agency in their life without doing what we're talking about here. Period. In the world. So, and we've done it before. And you mentioned Egypt. Why didn't they take the noses off the of the statue? It was a black nose. That's right. Why didn't they take the noses off the, the, the lips off? They were knocking off the identity. The first black doctor. What? What? Uh, I mean, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math, that's what we mastered back then. We were the innovators of all this stuff. We just, we, we lost our way. People were intimidated by, threatened by what we represented and knocked us off. Now, demographics are definitely that. Yeah. Now, so, you know, you can't, the country literally, God has a picture of this. The country literally cannot continue to be the superpower of the world. Literally cannot continue to succeed without black and people. First time ever in history, first time ever in world history, you actually now need people of color to succeed. This is this is revolutionary. It is. So I was asked, I've been asked repeatedly, John, when you were in front of the president, John, I want your politics. I'm so honored that people say they're not going to use the paper that might be from the United States to support. And I said, I'm not going to and I think the most radical transformation thing I can do is to teach a whole generation about the money, about free markets, about free enterprise, about entrepreneurship, about wealth creation, and to unleash an army of builders. That's the most radical, transformational, sustainable thing I can do. And tell you what, we do this for two, we did this for two to three years, and we started banning this like a flywheel effect in society. I just told you, we about three quarters, four to five hundred, we're in the bank. I'm trying to get legislation done as well as in Washington for talk HB college. Thank you, Lucy. You know, you take me out in two, three years. You can't stop the movement. Mm -hmm. No longer it's no longer relying on some person who might be charismatic and able to preach it. You killed Dr. King, you stop the movement. You killed Dr. Max, you stop what he was doing. You killed, you know, whatever the person, Gandhi, you could but 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 we are creating infrastructure, infrastructure in a system that has nothing to do with the personality. You know, you know, Steve Jobs created Apple, and it was about him for the first time. This is why they fired him because they stopped. But when he came back, iPad, iPhone, coming out, AirPods, coming out, iTunes, coming out. So, was it? Yeah, the books he's mentioned, the books, uh, Apple Watch. Apple Watch. All these things. Or stand alone. You, you, and, and by the way, every other technology then copied his That's right. technology. So it doesn't matter whether you would, I mean, and by the way, he wasn't the nicest guy in the world. He's not philanthropic. He's not a good father. I'm not making a moral statement about him. <laughs> but, but he was a genius. He was. And he had a good business plan for creating something that had a flyable effect. That's my, that's my business plan is, is the Apple, the Steve Jobs Apple effect on this work. Uh, to use whatever charisma I have or whatever to get people excited about this and then pour you into the infrastructure and get your credit score up, your debt down, your savings up so you can go after the capital, become a homeowner, become a small business owner, become an entrepreneur, become an employer. Then you got to do it, me. Then start getting back to university, start start, start making, becoming a donor, start creating an endowment, start creating generational wealth. Now, now the ones can stop you because, because not only can they not stop you, it's in the nation's interest. To to actually more. do more of it because of GDP. I said, when you create black wealth, even the races win. Yes. You guys get that? Because mm -hmm. GDP freezes. You know, when 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 the when the when the boat when the when the, when the ocean rises and everybody on the ocean benefits. So unless we want to speak Mandarin in ten years, we got to get we, the, the, the nation only the only works. In a country with 350 million people, as the largest sustained economy in the world, if everybody's in the boat roll. <laughs> so 
I, I know I asked that, I think it's a long way to answer that question, but it was a really radical transformational question. It's not about me, it's not about our movement, I call it the civil rights movement, the civil rights, the civil rights. From the streets to the sleep. It's not about becoming famous, it's about becoming dangerous. Okay. It's not about race to color line, it's about wealth and, uh, and agency, right? And, and, and it's in everybody's enlightened self interest, including this university, to, to do this. You, you literally can't succeed without this. And, and if we do it, all of a sudden, you stop arguing with your mates. All that's about money. Yes. You start making crappy decisions. I mean, why is a woman at a triple club at two in the morning with some 300 pound dude throwing her dog there? Because she wants to do that? Real talk. Why is a woman with a, with three women with some abusive dude? I mean, am I, am I making this is uncomfortable? I mean, it's real talk. Am I missing something? I mean, you think about the crazy stuff we do for money. And we rationalize it. Right. Nobody wants to talk about it. Right. It's uncomfortable. But but a lot of stupid stuff is done in the name of money. Let's knock it off. Let's start owning our, our agency, owning our lives, and then, and then freeing our brain to make decisions that just are in our, our self-interest, our enlightened self-interest. Knock off the stupid stuff. You know. Uh, so this is a master plan. This is not about an entrepreneurship program. This is not about it. It is, but it's not. This is really about, this is a radical movement of common sense for the third reconstruction. And I think that you guys are leading it. I think you're leading it, and I think that, uh, I think that you're going to inspire every other excuse for me to follow you. Lead. I think that the history books will write about you. I think this is an opportunity to build you in a lot of today. I think that this is everything. Now you're the right guy at the right time. Thank you you, you even you. left this position. <laughs> when they go do something else, you came back. Came back. Yes. This way, this way we won't get cut. So you gave yourself a promotion. You have to be here. You were the provost. Yes. I have to be here. He fired himself and came back. Exactly. I, exactly. I promise you the next answer will be short. I yeah. promise you. No, it doesn't have to. But it, it's good for you to, to do this. Yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> Did you say real talk? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as we look at again global entrepreneurship, um, you, uh, your organization, will be putting on this book, global forum. Mm -hmm. Now, some good things, and one is coming up. Yeah, thank you for it. What's that all about? How can again, you know, young people last to learn from and get something meaningful from forums like that? It's the Davos for Black people. I don't know if people know what Davos is. Yeah. Davos is the place in Switzerland where this panel uh, that's intentionally isolated, that wants to be recorded off by the military and wants to get in or out, much of a fast. And they select uh, 3,800 of the most powerful people in the world, all of them handpicked, uh, curated for the member of the academic, for the member of the nonprofit. A member of the Secretary of State, a member of politics, with the industry. They invite you to come to Davos once a year, and it's really hard to get to. Um, to me. And they cut a deal. Um, and it happens every year, and I was a young global leader uh, that was selected with the October 4th, 2004, and then that I was going to be there. I was going to be there last year, but it's not a secret society, but it's sort of hiding in plain sight. People don't really understand it. And we don't have that. So I created the, this really was an annual meeting that was like a public audit of our work. Like we take all this money in, but we, we put four billion dollars in capital and operational expenditures, so we make it on the small business so over $50 million in your budget. Well, you should, as a public, and, you know, you guys actually own operational budget because it's a nonprofit. Sure. So it's not owned by me, even though I found it and I control it. You actually own it. So you actually are shareholders, and everybody has the right to know how we're spending our money. This is actually right. Think about this. Every nonprofit, every nonprofit in America is a public entity owned by the public. You have a right to know what they're doing with their money. Let me ask a question. So the public, I 
started as a Republic Guard. Was first there. And then it became, it sort of morphed into a place where people came to build relationships out. Um, but again, the white spirit will make sure you're the people stable. And it's billionaires, it's millionaires, it's a thousand millionaires. of all these people in one place and it's the largest media in this time in the world. Mayors, uh, uh, Andre Dickens, uh, God bless him, is a poetry and back when he was in poetry. And um, uh, he's in the sense that he brought Ella Rodriguez to be there and uh, Reggie Jackson. And it, it, it's going to be very, 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 very powerful. Um, Charles Stein, Calabari, all these people. Uh, Big Stein, and Reggie Rodriguez, and Tom Rodriguez, and Tom Rodriguez. And this is where you can come and make it come and listen and like learn, but also everybody on campus can make your own whole commitment. You can make a commitment that you're going to teach. Go find a school in the area and adopt a school. Get your, get your sorority or fraternity or club and adopt a school or adopt a block or, and teach nature literacy or teach entrepreneurship. Pay it forward. Create, create self-curate your own commitment to do something. Is that going to do with me? I'll, I'll give you all the materials, I'll give you the infrastructure, I'll, you know, I'll lend you all credibility. We'll make you know, we'll cost you a dime with your energy. So we're, we're just like a toolbox. Very good. Is this, uh, do we have questions? We do. We have a few in the chat. Um, Stephen, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your, one of your I'm questions? I'm not the man here, also the question right here. Yeah, there's another question here? Okay. Question in first. Let's do let's do in house first, and then I will do the last. Um, thank you very much for coming here today as well. Um, my name is Laborda Butler. I'm a junior business major with a dual concentration in supply chain management and marketing. Um, my question to you is that um, we see that you're in a field that you get to see a wide overview of issues that might be hindering our communities. What tools can be provided to make a shift to help our communities? Evolve the size money. Mindset. So, what differentiates Black Caribbeans from Black Africans and African Americans? We're all Black. Is that slavery was institutionalized as a business here? So, there's only, in fact, here's a radical thing 40% of all slaves ended up in Brazil. 26% of all slaves ended up in the Caribbean. Another group ended up in Latin America. They were there before they were in North, in North America. They were, the second president of Mexico in 1555 was a mulatto of African descent. So slavery actually was, was all over the globe. And only 4 million, you know, near, I think less than 5% of slaves actually ended up in North America. But when everybody else knocked it off and said, hey, maybe you should stop this, America doubled down and turned it into a business form. But they couldn't have a big dude like you to come here with your own, I look in your eyes, you look straight in the eyes, you, you have confidence, you got some self esteem, you got, you, got, you, got, you got some pride, you got some dignity, you don't have anybody, anybody mess with you. That's a problem in that environment. Yes. That was a problem. They needed your bra, they needed your. So, back up a minute. Goes back to mindset. Hold on, back. Step back a minute. This perception that black people are were stupid and lazy. Again, this is power marketing. It's completely ridiculous. Why go halfway around the world to pick up somebody, enslave them, bring them all the way to another part of the world because they hate them? 
because they don't like them. Nobody, people are just selfish for that. It's self-interest. You only do that if they've got something you don't have. And what we think, what we had was a genius of the life. We understood how to take tough soil and bring it back to life. All the places that you had sugar, tobacco, cotton, all these were crops. 56% of all exports in America in the 1850s were tied to cotton. It was the driver of GDP, gross domestic product, for the whole country. All the millionaires were in Mississippi, Louisiana, I think it was West Virginia and Alabama. And the richest city in the world with per capita was not just Mississippi. Hello, what businesses are those folks in? Right? So this is what I'm trying to say is, but they couldn't have you come here as an agricultural genius, take the soil. This soil in the South is like the soil in Africa. It's hot, it's humid, it, it dies because it's, it's so everything's so intense. But we could bring it back to life and work in all kinds of Environments forever. But they couldn't have the attitude. So they held you down and they abused your wife. And you're fighting back, leave her alone! And they do it until you stop fighting. Because so what are they trying to kill? Oh. Oh, what else? They need this. They weren't trying to kill this. They need you to stop fighting. They need you to have no hope. And so you just be a robot. You do that for 270 years to become the little and better. So we have African Americans, we've been doing so much for so little for so long, we've been almost living in nothing. But the rules are published, the playing field level can kill us. Professional sports, the arts, politics, the rules are published, the playing field level we kill us. But in other places where it's okay, it's not so much. And so we have low self-esteem and high confidence. Mm -hmm. Self-esteem is how I esteem myself. If I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. If I don't respect me, don't expect me to respect you. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm going to make your life a living hell. Whatever goes around, when we talk about police brutality, we don't talk about black on black crime. It's inconvenient. But one of the biggest problems we have is us hurting us. Real talk. That's, that is that self-hate, that's that low self-esteem, that's depression that's embedded. Again, you drop down in our neighborhoods, nobody looks at the check cashers or pay loan lenders the rental. It's like normal. It's not normal. It's crazy. I can't say it. It's crazy stuff. <laughs> So when you come from the Caribbean islands, you had that slave experience for a very short period of time. When you saw doctors who looked like you, when you saw lawyers who looked like you, a prime minister, you saw you know, but the whole ecosystem. You come here like, you know, a little bit of oppression, but basically, what am I going to do? Uh, you come from Nigeria, you, you come from Ghana, wherever, Rwanda, same thing. You just, you know, you come here with a, your mindset. In, in place. And so you, you have less resources, you have less of what we have, but you have something that we don't have, which is self uh The longer answer your question, but it's a really good question. You, so we you gotta we, we have gotta attack the thing straight on, real talk, that really hobbling us. Three ways you live. Suicide, and you can be that you can be dead walking, which is what you mentioned earlier, right? The most dangerous person in the world is the person will know. So think about it. You drive, leave campus and go see some brother down the corner street and just blaze the eyes. Then move out of his way. He ain't got nothing to lose. You got a bunch. So suicide, coping, healing. Those three ways of living. What most of us do? Coping. Hanging, shopping, chilling. Drugging, drinking, smoking, or fill in the eyes. What we're not doing is healing. That's just too dumb. That's just that's too that's too painful. So we, we just avoid it. But that's it. That, that's really what, what, I, what I'm talking about is you, you got we gotta deal with we gotta deal with ourselves before ourselves deals 
with us and get it out of the way. You know they know, you know they're 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 only African American ghettos in America, most likely. There are no Jamaican, Jamaican, Nigerian ghettos in America. I don't mean communities where Jamaicans live. I mean like shooting, banging, you know, I mean there are problems. And that's American. Am I missing something? So again, it's, it's we're hiding in plain sight. It's the problem of hiding in plain sight. No one's called them out. No one's no one's addressing. So what I'm saying is, are, are we tired of being punked? Are we tired of being played? Are we tired of being the butt of everybody's joke? I mean, aren't we tired of it? We're brilliant. So let's it's time to rise up. We gotta get this right. We gotta get our heads right. Baby mama, baby dad. Huh? It's a mother or a father. What, what, is, I, what, what, what does that mean? I'm a baby dad. I'm a ba Imagine what that makes the kid feel like. I, I don't have the honor of having a mother or a father. I, I was on the way here, and Charlemagne posted some video, and there's two women arguing with some dude who, the dude couldn't be more disrespectful. I guess he's a household man. I don't know who he is. Luckily, I can't remember his name at the moment. I actually had to send Charlemagne a text. Like, is this real? Like, is this like a real situation? Be because this is like normal. I was watching two weeks ago, ex, ex NBA player and his girlfriend arguing about her having OnlyFans page. But they weren't arguing with each other. He was on social media on his channel. She's on social media on her channel. They're having a private conversation, but they're talking to their own social media channels about their private business. You know how cray cray this is? We, we normalize it. There's nothing normal about that. First of all, that's some private stuff you shouldn't want anybody to be in your business. He's basically saying his woman, his woman has gotten a side hustle on OnlyFans, basically selling her body. That's their business. They know that. But why? But she's talking to her social media channel. I don't know what she's doing. But first of all, they're not talking to each other. They're talking to people who literally don't care about what's going on with you. We normalize this. None of this stuff is normal. None of it. So we need more people that we, for the next last eight minutes, you look me straight mind. You not look a way. That's self-esteem. That's not self-confidence. That's self-esteem. Self-confidence is confidence that's displayed in confidence. You have confidence about engineering, confidence about some skill you have, and you lean into that because you're, you, you execute those jobs. But that's nothing to do with how you esteem yourself. You love yourself enough to look me straight in the eye. I don't see any drama. I've I intentionally provoked you. I, you, you have not, your, your shoulders haven't gone back, your head's not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> you're just normal. That's what we need. We need normal. We need a lot of black normal. Now here's the good news. The book The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell, University of Illinois study, proves that five percent role models in the community say they're black. Tipping point is the name of the book. Malcolm Gladwell is the author. He looks white, he's actually black, he's from Jamaica, I believe. The one is Christian, he's actually Colin Powell's nephew, very known fact. Uh, brilliant author, he's written several books, but this book called The Tipping Point, and there's a University of Illinois study. It states that five percent of all role models, college role models in a community, community say they're black. Now, I didn't say eighty percent role models. I didn't say fifty. I didn't say twenty. It's five. That's how powerful God is. That's how powerful hope is. It is all it requires is a super minority, minority of people to embrace it, and it should stabilize for everything. The devil is a pawn. Fear is a lazy bastard, but. It, all the choices that are really available to us are here. Oh, I'm sorry, here. <laughs> so, so we grab those, but they don't work. So, Doc King only has 20% of the black community support. He's a literal fact at its height. He only has 20% of the white community support at its height, even if he wanted to know what he was like. So, he still changed the world, which we're talking about on this more today when there's a lot. So, 5% to 20% of what we're looking for. Always moving these. All you need is 
of people who are in your monitor, your leadership. The second probably is over you know, five years, or when you're talking to the first year, maybe ten years. Okay. Question? Okay, so this is a question from Stephen from Lay Security. When you are in the initial phase of building a services company, what's the best way to go from fulfilling every role to delegating work so you can focus on business development and then building a corporate culture? Good, great question. Initially, I did every job myself, one because I can afford it. Otherwise, it was just great training, and then also people, when I told somebody to do it, I wasn't saying do as I do, and not as I do as I say, and not as I do. So they can role model my behavior and knew that I, that I did. I was no better than them. I did every job that they've done. And also, I could tell when they weren't doing the job. You guys done it before. You didn't play it. Um, now, it's a great question because as you're doing a business, initially, quantitative is more important. So the cash register just has to add up, and you have a it's hand to hand combat. But at a certain point, you got to go from quantitative to qualitative. And as you go far enough to the North Pole and you miscalculate, you go far to the North Pole, you end up south. So you actually, you can, you can start doing everything yourself. And then when you don't grow, you continue doing it yourself. Now, so you'll call it diminishing returns. So let me put that in plain English. 3.1 million black businesses in America, 96% don't have their employees. No infrastructure, no accounting system. You don't grow. And as a result of that, we got no generational wealth. So at a certain point, so I was with this guy last night at the dinner, and he was like, well, you know, you're trying to get six months career. And I said, you know, you want 5% of something, or 100% of nothing. So he had this big company, and they were, they were going to give him participation in the company, but he doesn't own the company. So if you're a huge company, or you can take a small company and own 100% of it, but who knows how big that small company is going to grow. That's if you want 100% of nothing or 10% of something. So latch on yourself, in, in this, my example, of this big company, get percent of that. Then another, another misnomer we have is, well, we don't want to sell the company. We want to own it all. No, no, no. The whole purpose of capitalism is to grow it, build it, sell it, monetize it, and reset and do it all over again. Whatever decision you make emotionally is a bad decision. Right. Business is not emotional. Capitalism is a gladiator sport. I sold that company in 2021. And he said, yes, this is not a problem for me. I, I'm not, I sort of partner in it, but that was the point. It was to buy it, it was made it, build it, do it well, expand it. And what we did, by, what we did initially through contracts, which like contracted property management, contracted accounting, contracted audit, because I was at a small team, it, the question is question. But at a certain point, that became diminishing returns because contracting is an efficient model that is actually not cost effective. Right? That's even more expensive. So now we're, the new company is actually bringing property management internal and is bringing accounting inside of GC for accounting. Well. So it's cheaper to pay that person a salary to do accounting than it is to contract with a, an accounting firm uh, right. as you grow. So, but, but, but what's smart for you at the six month mark is not the same as smart for you at the six year mark. So, you're, so like a person that's constantly growing, I was with somebody who had a newborn a few years ago, and she's changing the baby's uh, shoes. Uh, you know, she's never changed her baby's shoes. And she told me every six, I think she said every three months. But every, the baby's just growing. So you, you get this outfit, and then six months later, you get another outfit. So that's like a business. Like you can create an outfit for the business, but if you don't keep your finger on the post, you got a, an outfit that the baby's outgrown from. And you're still trying to grab that outfit down to say, you know, the outfit can't, the baby can't, can't fit anymore. So you got to. Love is work. That's what I'm telling you. Yes. Not, love is work, non love is laziness, anti love is evil. Evil exists is very real. So if you're lazy, this is not the right space for you. Whatever you love is going to drive you crazy and require constant attention. So this business is going to require you to keep your finger on the pulse every week. What's going on? How are you doing? Just like your child, just like your mate. You can't put it on remote control, you can't mail it in. Right? You can't you can't floss. You got to be about growing the enterprise, and you got to be passionate to be continually engaged. So I hope that answers that question. Is there any other questions internally? I have a similar question. Um, has there any, ever been a, any point in your career or your journey that you felt stuck, and what helped you take the next step to go to the next level? It's a great question. 
I meant over indexes, the guys in the room. Um, been many times I felt stuck. By the way, if you ever grew tired, from, which is different from exhausted, I'm exhausted all the time. I was exhausted when I got home last night. But once you're, the exhaustion is easily cured. You just get some rest, right? And when you, once you're rested, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get a bear again. But if you're tired, you're the wrong person, you're in the wrong place, or you're doing the wrong thing. It's either or and. Right? So uh, I've had times when I've been very rare, thank God, where I've been tired and I had to make a change in my life. Um, I had to figure out what I was tired of or whatever. Uh, and you have to have the courage to then make those changes. Um, stuck. I, I don't think I've ever felt felt I, I felt literally stuck because I, I'm in I've got agency in my own life, so that's really that's really just my fault. Like I, I could I could move Bob and leave. I can go do something else. Like I'm the chairman, founder, chief executive officer. Like I, as long as it's legal, I can go do what I want to do. And if, I, if I see some opportunity, or if I don't see opportunity, I can go find something. I have felt um, that the doors were open to me, um, but I take no provided ones. So I just knock on more doors. Uh, success is going through seven to seven without loss of enthusiasm. So I just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a hustler, man. I just never give up. Over the round, it's a little bit to it. I just keep banging, keep banging, keep banging. So I've gotten frustrated. I've gotten exhausted. I've gotten worn out. I need to go take a break. I felt like people weren't paying me weren't responding to my interest. But that's different from like they've been feeling like I was I was stuck. I just felt felt like people weren't hearing me. Now now the opposite of that is now I feel like I've got I've already wanted relevancy. Now I've almost got too much relevancy at the same time. So I'm just overwhelmed by the incoming. And so I want to just say bump it to go sit on the beach somewhere, but I can't because this is what I asked for. And this is my time. So now you just gotta, just gotta buckle up and double down. Um, I guess, actually, that's a, good, that's a good example. I feel stuck now. I feel stuck in, in my own skin. Because what I really need to do is I need to be institutionalized in this so it's not a problem. But, but it's stuck with me. Until, I, until it's not. Does it make any sense? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get it out of me. And I'm trying to create acolytes and more Ed Eberhardt, and more, <laughs> you know, more, more Janae Roscoe's, and more Mary Harrison's, and like these people work for Lance Triggs. Make Lance Triggs a star. Make Brian Betts a star. Make, make the Dean a star. Like, it's not about me. But it may be initially about me because maybe I have a certain gift that allows me to communicate. Yeah. But so that, in that way, I feel, I feel stuck with me. Does that make sense? And unless you're a complete ego maniac, which is not a good feeling. There are people who love that, that just love being the center of attention. It's not, I don't need that one. I'm only doing this because it's, I'm, I'm only doing all this visual stuff because it's effective. Not because I need it. I can go read a book. I can go sit on the beach for a long time. I can sit behind a computer and I'm just as happy as can be. No, Huh? No, you can't. No, I, no, I can't. I won't. I mean, I can't just here. Are there any other questions for all of you? No, thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming here to talk to us today. I'm Stuart Israel, a senior business administration concentration in finance. So, my question for you is what advice would you give a senior to like leverage your network and become successful when it comes to meeting people? Because I know it's about who you know and it's not as. It's not as um, like important, even though it is important about what you know, but it is about who you know. So, like, how would you give advice to us about leveraging our network to the fullest capability? Yeah, great question. I love that you're looking me straight in the eye. You obviously um, have found some way to become reasonably comfortable in your own skin. Um, so, kudos to you. Thank you. A um, couple points. Not everybody's going to understand. Most people are not going to understand you. Most girls, friends, are not going to completely get you. That has to be okay. Uh, I did a documentary last night, and there was a video that this guy asked me to do on the way out. It's on social media. 
about different kinds of birds, three types of birds, like the desert people, eagle, club, and turkey. I won't repeat that if you don't watching it. But eagles don't fly to pets. You've never seen a flock of eagles. So now everybody's going to get you, they're going to understand you. That's okay. So just continue to be an eagle. And understand if you hang around nine fold people, you'll be the ten. So you want relationships, not contact. You you want to build rapport and relationship with people who are smarter than you, uh, versus you being the center of attention and everybody being dumber than you. You want to not just hang around people that you're comfortable with, you want to be uncomfortable. You need to go do an internship at least once a year. Go, go, go on, go, go figure out who or what industry you want. Penetrate. Meet somebody in that industry who has influence. Spend a few minutes like you're spending with me. They'll be impressed with you like I am. And either they'll offer you an internship or you should ask for one. And I can't imagine anybody would say no. So asking for an internship. Yes. Do you have any open opportunities? No, but I but but, but you shouldn't take no for an answer. I don't uh, I don't have any open opportunities for internships because I don't have a formal program we're planning one. But we have job opportunities that are available. You go to the website and find those. And we have a financial, we have a, a file program of fellows, interns, and loan executives, which I've authorized, which Ed, by the way, here <coughs> uh, she is uh, sort of charge of. And you should but you should badger him to, to hurry up, hurry up, hurry up <laughs> on the program. And 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 maybe you should be considered as an early adopter. It depends off how you know convincing you are. And my guess is, is, if you want to be an intern at Operation Hope, my guess is, looking at you, within brief conversations, you could engineer that. But don't just stop with me. Figure out who you're, who, who, wherever, what is it that you're interested in? What industry? So right now I'm looking at a financial rotation um, opportunity because I don't know what specifically I'm going to do in finance yet, but I think a rotation one would be right for me so I can figure out what I want to do in the future. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, so actually, I, I take that back. I was I, you are probably looking for the right tree. As of course that is half of my business is finance. So I would actually be all over him like a cheap suit. Don't let him out the door until he says yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like and, and uh, you have my support. So you're, you're fantastic. Thank you. And then you, you what you do is you want to make sure you get you get that internship and then by the way, I'm sure we pay, but if I were you, I'd be paying free. I'd be, I'd be completely unconcerned about whether somebody paid me 10, 15 bucks an hour. It doesn't matter. What you want is a relationship capital. Mm -hmm. What you want is to be in that room. You want to, you want to ear hustle. Mm -hmm. Right? You, you want to shake the right hands. You want to get the right cards. You want people to remember you. And then you want to leverage yourself to, to, to volunteer at the Home Global Forum. And you want to be, you want to be right behind Ed Eberhardt or Kevin Boucher or one of my lieutenants. And after you know that week, you have probably five offers to go do something else that you'll drop up. <laughs> but anyway, great question, great intensity of focus. Um, now everybody's going to get you. It's okay. You have to go alone sometimes. It's different from being lonely. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was coming up, people teased me. Hey, I wore suits like in the hood. I used to wear suits. In the <laughs> days, right? People beat me up. Take my briefcase. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people laughed at me. Oh, this is this Catholic. Man. These same people today, the ones that are not prison, probation, parole, or working at CBS or whatever, which is nothing wrong with that, calling me for a job. <laughs> calling me for, can I, hey, uh, uh, can, I, uh, can, I, can I talk to you about an investment? Well, uh, I don't say it to them, but I'm saying, to them, wait, what are you doing? I don't I don't rub it in their nose, but I, I, I remember. So there are no ugly billionaires. And that's really a, just a, a just a, a general statement for saying just stay focused on your objectives, your goals, and make it quite sexy in achieving your objectives. And everybody that you think you want to be like will want to be like you. Just don't lose focus. I see the focus. Just don't lose focus. Ignore the noise all around you. A bunch of noise. It doesn't matter. What's your name again? Sierra Israel. Did you have mom and dad? Huh? Did, you have mom, did you have mom and dad with you growing up in your, in your okay. house? 
I'm not ascribing intention. I'm not saying somebody's a good or a bad person. I don't have a right to say somebody's a good or a bad person. I'm saying that the first thing you need to do is remove yourself from toxic environments because toxicity and anger and fear corrode like cancer the container that's sitting with it. So hurt people hurt people. Right? Somebody can say they love you. They destroy you. And don't even know it. Because somebody destroyed them. So if you don't know what love is, then you're literally passing down that unknowing to somebody else and you think it's love. So you gotta have enough discernment inside of yourself to know, okay, I love you, I love all y'all. You gotta say you gotta talk to me before you tell me that. I love all y'all. I hate a lot of you. Y'all crazy. <laughs> or you know what? It's ten o'clock, eleven o'clock. This is not a safe neighborhood. You say to yourself, I, "I'm out." Y'all can say, "I gotta go." You gotta go. You say, "Girl, you wanna come with me?" I got. We gotta go. I got class tomorrow at seven in the morning, and I need two hours of study, and I need six hours of sleep. You say to yourself, "I gotta go." Charity starts at home. I gotta go. You, you need to know the word no. I gotta go. This is not for me. I'm cool. That's a one. I'm, I'm cool is really good. That, that works in most situations. I'm good. I'm cool. You're not making any judgment. There's a whole bunch of drama going on. It has no value whatsoever. We're spending money we don't have in places that don't want you to impress people you don't know about shit that don't matter. Yeah. Every week. For what? <laughs> so I did a video last week on home ownership. We should own a home. Bank owns a home. The bank owns a home if you don't pay. That's right. People on TV. Uh, poor people shouldn't own a home. The rich person telling poor people not to own a home owns a home. That's like literally true. Like I'm on these I'm on NBC last week. These talking heads 
on TV telling poor people and telling millennials, you should go home, go experience, go travel, whatever. All of them on their own. Why do you tell somebody else to not do something that you're doing? The number one way you do it well in America is home ownership. Without question, undeniable. But we've been discouraged from owning a home. Oh, well, the subprime crisis of 2008 should prove that we should own a home. Not true. That should prove you don't want financial literacy. Because what they did is they took a, 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 they took, pick a payment, pick a payment, and turn it into a mortgage. Because we were financially illiterate, we asked what the payment was, not what the interest rate was. So we got taken out because we took a financially illiterate situation in the dream and turned it into a $300,000 economic bomb. And then you got some capitalists sitting in, in D.C. They don't hate you. They're trying to get paid. And they're like, well, it's easy to pit black people and brown people because they have high dreams and aspirations. They want this big house. And they don't know anything about money. So give, so give it to them. We'll earn all this money in the short term. We'll get the house back. <laughs> right? I mean, is that personal? And then when we want to think, oh, and somebody's racist, they targeting us. They don't care enough about you to hate you. It's business. It's business. It's just bad capitalism. What we need is good capitalism. There's good debt and bad debt. Good debt is debt, that is debt that you attach something that appreciates. Home ownership, small business, the things that appreciate. Bad debt is financing jewelry, financing a, 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 a trip to Jamaica or whatever. That, that's bad. And there's a lot of that going on, right? Financing a, a, a ticket to the NFL game for $5,000. I mean, what people are, people are just nuts. Yes. So you've got to, first thing you got to do is you got to save yourself. Because you can't get anybody else if you're told from the floor. So you, you're going to have a toxic environment when you leave this room. Because, you're, because people will grow up in our neighborhood in toxic environments, not because they're bad people. And once you cleanse your current environment, and then you start, you start collecting your tribe. Go through your day, your week, collecting your people of people. Uh, you don't say it. You say, this is my kind of people. This is my kind of people. Maybe one out of 300 people you meet, and you grab a hold of them, and you intentional about nurturing those relationships, and you bring those people close to you, and you and it's your special forces to you, and and you keep them close to you, and that's who you hang out with. You you, you spend time, do you, know, you don't want anybody to know that you really undercover, got it together. You don't want to be ostracized. You don't want to be penalized. But internally, you know, you're having several conversations. You talk to the general population, and then you really bond in with, with your crew, right? And and then once you have your crew and you have your strength, now you've got strength in numbers. Now you can go out and do whatever you want to do, and you know, you know, what? Really, just start flowing differently, thinking differently, operating differently, doing different stuff, and then you'll find other people want to be like you. And that's how you ultimately go back to this mindset shift. Back. The five percent tell the game the way of the dog, but you've got to get you right first, and you got to understand. There's a game going on here, and it's meant to separate you from your money. It's meant to keep you poor. It's meant to keep you uh, depressed because people benefit. You know, 54 million Americans are antidepressants coming out of the pandemic. 54 million. And that's just people who went and got a prescription. We're not talking about all the people we know doing weed, <laughs> doing all kind of other stuff that we don't want to talk about, alcohol. You add up. The stuff that doesn't get reported with the stuff that gets reported, it's got to be the majority of people in the country. Just coping. That's depression. An addiction is a reaction to an emotion you can't handle. That's what addiction is. You're doing something to distract yourself from the other stuff over here you don't want to deal with. That's your environment. That's all of our environment. So you either get into it, oh, well, I want to be popular, I want to be or you like them, okay, that's the tip of that. Or you ostracize yourself, and then, okay, now you're lonely and alone and people pick on you. There's another choice. There's another choice. And that's what I just described. And I'm looking at you, and I can tell that you're bilingual. You, you can speak both languages at the same time. And that's, it, 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 you know, that's how we both, how, 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 how you succeed, but also how you save your people. So here's my way I live my life. Talk without being offensive. Listen without being defensive. And always leave even your adversary with their dignity. 
Because if you don't, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. You could humiliate them, you shame them, you disrespect them, and they'll do anything to protect their self image, including kill people. So hurt people are actually dangerous. This is all we don't have time for this, but hurt people, not only are hurt people, hurt people when you hurt them and you damage their self image and you do it publicly, they may take you out. So you gotta be very they're like emotional hand grenades, you gotta put them down. Very good. Is this making any sense to you guys? Yeah. Yes. So you gotta go. You, you, living, living a successful life is interesting. I just made it a game. I play a game with myself. Everything. I just, I, people just amuse me. I read people really well. That's the gift. That's that's the result of me having to walk through the minefield my whole life. Because now I read people very well. I can tell. I can see drama coming. Typically. So every now and then I miss it. I get vulnerable with them. It, by the way, the, the people who really mess with me, they're not strangers. Everybody who's strange screwed me over. I, I, I know. Because I, I let my guard down. So I want you to just start reading. It's like a movie, The Matrix. The Matrix. The Red Pill. The Blue Pill. I want you to start reading the situation. Don't say anything. But understand who's in that really close to you. And hold up. Most people need to keep this up. We good? We good? No, we all good. Yeah, I'm cool. I'm good. Everybody, I'm good. That was really good. I'm good. So what you're really doing is saying, I'm crazy and I don't know what you saying over here. We go out on Tuesday from 6 to 8. That's just saying to yourself. But what I can't do with you after 8 o'clock. Because you're not. You're about to get me in trouble. Love you guys. Love you too. <laughs> Everyone. Uh, that uh, is in the room uh, on Zoom. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. This is, um, for me, was quite uh, instructional. I hope it was for you. As we look through this week to highlight entrepreneurship, one of the three prongs of my stool for this academy getting you to the way you want to go as entrepreneurs. What John has spoken about today says exactly that whatever you're doing, you have to be an entrepreneur. Which means the mindset. The mindset. If you have that mindset, you will always, always distinguish yourself.